Ah, the Republic. A thousand years of peace. Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. They say every military force is built for the last conflict that they fought in. And so, in the first year of any war, the side that is the most innovative, the one willing to take the biggest risks and think outside the box the most, can have a huge advantage against their foes. You might be surprised to know that before World War II started in earnest, that on paper the French army and air force eclipsed their German counterparts when it came to quantity and arguably quality as well. The French Char B1 heavy tank is not something many people have heard of, but on May 16, 1940, at the village of Stone on the border of Belgium and France, a single one of these heavy tanks reportedly took out a column of 13 Panzer III's and IVs in just a few minutes. It was said that the French tank was hit about 140 times and still safely withdrew from its position. And so how did a technologically and numerically superior French army fall to the Germans? Well, France had planned on fighting a slow, grueling defensive war like the last conflict they were in, World War I, and so it had built a static defense line in the Maginot Line. The Char B1 platform, as robust as it was in a defensive engagement, was terribly slow. It had a top speed of around 13 miles per hour off-road and was a gas guzzler. The Germans succeeded because of their doctrine of Blitzkrieg and mobile warfare. They bypassed the Maginot Line and went through the Ardennes Forest in Belgium and drove right around and past the French army. They managed to capture Paris within a month. The Germans had perfected their combined arms tactics. For instance, their bombers were carrying out four times the sorties as their French counterparts. They had essentially invented modern maneuver warfare. Also, they had a lot of meth. You know, like, so much for pure Aryan blood, right? Now, there was just a 22-year gap between the Battle of France and the end of World War I. 22 years for French military doctrine to head in the complete wrong direction, and for the Germans to head in the right direction. So imagine just how completely unprepared for warfare the Galactic Republic was when the Clone Wars began. Not only had there not been a large-scale military conflict in the galaxy for a thousand years, there hadn't been a Republic Federal military in a thousand years. The Galactic Republic was politically, culturally, and also economically not prepared for the civil war that was to come. The Confederacy of Independent Systems at least had tested its droid army on numerous occasions against various groups. The Trade Federation even engaged in a large open field battle against the Gungans during their invasion of Naboo. It was during that battle they learned that having a centrally controlled droid system was a terrible idea, something they fixed by the time the Clone Wars had started. And so today we'll be giving you guys a little bit of insight on what a war looks like when you've had a thousand years of peace beforehand. Things are going to get ugly. You know, all things considered, those dolphins on Kamino did a hell of a job creating the clone army. These were highly trained, well-motivated young men in the prime of their shortened lives. They had a terrific leadership structure, from the clone commanders down to the NCOs, even the lowest-ranking clones could be expected to rise to the occasion and lead small units when the command chain was broken down. What was a problem were the senior non-clone commanders that were placed in charge of large formations. You know, things wouldn't have been nearly as bad had the Republic, like the separate destroyed army, chosen planetary defense force officers to lead their army, or heck, even mercenaries would have been a better choice. But no, the Republic looked towards their one-size-fit-all solution for almost every problem in the galaxy up until now, and chose the Jedi Order to lead this new military force. I mean, these were pacifist monks who, at best, were diplomats or law enforcement officers. If you're familiar with the High Republic era that precedes the Clone Wars, it was a time when the Jedi had begun focusing more and more on non-lethal methods of combat and de-escalation. I mean, there were definitely periods of Jedi history where they were better suited for these type of positions, but uh, the High Republic definitely put them on an opposite trajectory. And so, when this era of Jedi entered the battlefield, they didn't really have the right mindset to face the life or death struggle that was happening all around them. And so what you got were commanders who were constantly concerned about the ethics of what they were doing, which oftentimes led to them being too passive in their command. You lack faith in the Jedi. I find their tactics ineffective. The Jedi Code prevents them from going far enough to achieve victory, to do whatever it takes to win. The very reason why peacekeepers should not be leading a war. You know, Tarkin, despite being a power-hungry fool, who probably fantasizes a bit too much about getting into slightly erotic shirtless knife fights with his own men, was not wrong about this. The Jedi were not ruthless enough for the battlefield. And this oftentimes led to their force getting decimated, which put the Jedi commanders in a tough situation. And oftentimes less skilled and less emotionally balanced Jedi commanders were tempted to use the dark side 
in order to survive. The Jedi, historically speaking, only struggled in conflicts or were corrupted by it. Because in warfare, it's extremely hard to follow the Jedi code. There were no rules, especially if you're a Canadian with an entrenching tool. The only time a Jedi was ready to do what was necessary in order to win was whenever they saw a red lightsaber, like when Sol and his team of Jedi saw Chimera and Kofar. Notice how they charge headfirst recklessly without really thinking, and how they all get blasted by one giant force push. Now, Jedi trained in how to control their emotions, and how to use the force. They memorized the Jedi Code and dabbled in the philosophy of the Order. They also spent hours a day practicing their martial arts and lightsaber forms. Through no fault of their own, they spent zero hours on learning military command, strategy, and logistics. They understood very little about the equipment their clones used in battles or the capabilities of their troops, their vehicles, their fighters and ships. And as a result, the first few battles in which the Jedi led their men against the Separatists were complete bloodbaths. Take a look at the Battle of Geonosis, which took place on the irradiated plains of the planet. The GAR landed their Acclimator-class assault ships and quickly unloaded roughly 200,000 clones about a few clicks away from the Geonosian's fortified positions. The Jedi would then proceed to lead their soldiers in a direct frontal attack across a extremely flat surface with no cover, there was hardly even any preparation work done by artillery or air supports. This was the charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava, or Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. A terribly conceived attack that needlessly cost the lives of many soldiers. The Republic only managed to win this battle because they somehow shot down several core ships that created a hectic sandstorm that covered the entire battlefield, limiting visibility to only a few feet. This ineptitude wouldn't stop there, it would go on for at least another year. A lot of Jedi generals let their command their Padawans learn on the battlefield with actual real clones beneath their charge. This is it, your first command. Don't be nervous. I wish everyone would stop saying that. The men you're commanding are depending on you. During the first battle of Ryloth, Ahsoka Tano was allowed to lead a squadron of V-19 fighters against an enemy blockade. Not only did she refuse to follow orders, she got her entire wing destroyed in an offensive engagement where their main job was to screen their own destroyers from enemy fighters. As a result, the Republic fleet lost a Venator-class Star Destroyer in the enemy's counterattack and were forced to withdraw. This is what happens when you have a thousand years of peace. You think stuff like this is a good idea. Later on in the war at Felucia, Jedi Commander Ahsoka Tano became too focused on attacking her enemies and as a result got her troops completely enveloped by a larger Separatist force. She actually believed that she had the enemy on the run and was only saved at the last minute by her master. I know I was wrong. I just got so caught up in my own success, I didn't look at the battle as a whole. I wasn't being disobedient, I just... forgot. I don't blame Ahsoka for being a terrible commander. I blame the Jedi Order for being arrogant enough to believe that an understanding of the Force and a mastery of the Force made them somehow good commanders in the field. Masters, this incident is my responsibility. Because of Ahsoka's advanced abilities, I forgot how young she is. I gave her more freedom than I should have. As messed up as it sounds, it wasn't always obvious that children don't belong on the battlefield. I mean, in our own world, only in the last 20 years has the global community actually tried to do something about this. Throughout most of our short history here on Earth, children have fought in every major conflict and continue to do so even today, especially in the Global South. In the Republic Commando series, which unfortunately is now Legends, a lot of clones were very pissed off about the Battle of Geonosis. They completely lost faith in their Jedi commanders. Um, and this makes sense after what happened. I mean, the amount of casualties were horrendous. The clone commander units lost almost 50% of their numbers because they were deployed as basic infantry troopers, despite their special forces designation. They were just wasted like cannon fodder. This would actually lead to a buildup of resentment amongst the clone troopers that would last the entire war. It's not really something we see a lot of in the Clone War series, which kind of sucks. Because in Legends, at least, a lot of clones were prepared for Order 66, whether they had inhibitor chips or not. You could say that some might have really wanted to do it anyway. So the clone army is not as well equipped as you might think. And I, and I saw in our recent video where we compared uh, 200 clones versus 200 uh, stormtroopers, there are a lot of people who like the clone army and I think are blind to this issue. Most of their weapons and gear had not been battlefield tested. Take the DC-15, this was a massive 1.3 meter in length uh, rifle, which was fine on the massive planes of Geonosis, it gave them a lot of reach, but this type of battle rifle was too bulky. 
for urban combat situations or ship boarding actions. Also, clones mostly fought as mechanized infantry, and so getting in and out of their dropships and ATTEs also proved difficult with this huge walking stick. This would eventually be remedied with the DC 15S carbine. You know, the clone army in the last year of the war was completely different from when it deployed on Geonosis. There's actually a huge, drastic change. Another example of this would be the clone's uh, Phase 1 armor, which was also very poorly designed. It was incredibly stiff and tight, especially in the joint areas. The Kaminoans had designed the armor to fit the clones, but failed to understand how the human body actually moved. You know, the Kaminoans were really tall and lanky, the clones, human beings, are not, and so the only position you're comfortable in wearing that, uh, phase one armor was in like a T pose. This made sitting down or being in a crouch firing position very uncomfortable and that is a huge problem. The helmets also were needlessly pressurized which meant that natural air circulation did not exist in this helmet especially if the uh, power packs ran out. Also the visibility in these visors was extremely poor. Phase 1 armor probably increased the fatigue of the clones over the duration of a mission, which definitely decreased their performance. Phase 2 clone trooper armor would seek to address many of the clones' concerns. The clones, despite being heavily outnumbered by the separate destroyed army, oftentimes as much as 20 to 1, didn't have a significant advantage in firepower when it came to small arms. Well, actually, let me reiterate, they didn't have a lot of practical um, firepower that was mobile. Like, for instance, they had a bunch of E-webs, but these were stationary heavy blasters that needed to be deployed on large bipods. They're not really mobile enough for a light infantry force or a mechanized infantry force. The clone's early solution to mobile firepower was the Z6 rotary blaster cannon that could only be fired from the hip and didn't have a deployable bipod for some reason. And then you had the even more ridiculous reciprocating quad blaster cannon. This was essentially a handheld, miniaturized version of an anti-air uh, blaster, and you like strap it to your chest. It's, it's stupid. Both of these weapons had a lot of firepower, but were tiring to use and left the operator completely exposed. What the clones really needed at the squad level was a T-21 light repeating blaster to give you more suppression, but they were rarely seen, especially in the earlier years of the war. The Stormtrooper Corps, however, would learn quite a lot from the early mistakes of the clone army and had a variety of different repeating blasters and heavy blasters to supplement their basic E-11. Carbine. A clone rifle squad, despite being much better trained, just had a lot less firepower than a stormtrooper equivalent. For the last year of the war at Umbara, the clones were far better prepared to fight the separate destroyed army and were even deployed with light mortars that could be set up in seconds. The Clone Wars, in a lot of ways, was like the Truman Show. It might have felt real for the clones who were dying on the front lines, but the reality was this was a controlled conflict. I mean, both sides were fighting for the Sith. For instance, at the Battle of Geonosis, the Separatists had over 5 million droids that they could have deployed, and the Republic had only 200,000 clones. The Separatist military decided to run during that battle, most likely because destroying the clone army then and there would have ended the war prematurely, and Palpatine would have never been able to completely subvert the institutions that guarded democracy in the Republic. As a matter of fact, in the Clone Commando series, which again is an excellent alternative view of kind of how the clones saw the war, a lot of these higher ranking clones who had access to the, uh, you know, troop numbers were just confused why the Separatists then just launch an all-out attack and overwhelm uh, clone garrisons in the Outer Rim and just take the core because they could have easily done this, especially in the first few years of the conflict. This is why a lot of the clone commandos started getting like a little bit paranoid and suspicious of the Republic. I mean, if you take a look at the Separatist Navy, for instance, they were pretty much prepared for battle when the war had started. The Republic only had Acclimator class assault ships at the beginning of the war. This was a lightly armored and armed troop transport. The Vanderer class Star Destroyer was still months away from deployment. And so, aside from a few diplomatic and judicial cruisers, which weren't armed and needed to be retrofitted with weapons, the Republic didn't really have much of a navy at all. Even its fighter corps during the Battle of Geonosis was made out of proprietary fighters like the Experimental B-19 and the Jedi Aether Sprite Light Interceptor. It's truly a miracle that none of those acclimators were shot down over Geonosis because each one of those ships had like 16,000 troops on board, like what, 7-8% of the entire J.A. army would have been destroyed if even one of those ships had gone down. So again, maybe the Separatists purposely avoided doing that. I don't know. The Y-Wing was also a prototype that Anakin Skywalker forced into service during the battle against the Malevolence a few months later. This is because the Republic Navy had no other fighter bombers that could carry the amount of firepower he needed to take on this massive Separatist super ship. The first year of the Clone Wars was completely disorganized and extremely hectic for the Republic, but in all honesty, if you take a look at the history of the galaxy, 
This is how the Republic fought wars. I mean, it was always like this in the beginning of any conflict they were involved in. The Old Republic was known for using its massive size to literally slow down enemy forces that were attacking from the peripherals of the galaxy. This is the same strategy that Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek used in the 1930s when the Imperial Japanese Army invaded the Chinese mainland. He basically was just like, okay, come on in, take as much land as you want, we're just gonna step back. Chiang Kai-shek did very little to stop the Japanese incursion into China, knowing that the Imperial Army didn't have enough manpower, resources, nor a desire to take on that much territory. They really just wanted Manchuria. And the Republic would use a very similar strategy, you know, all throughout their history, they've really kept small peacetime military forces. Most democracies don't like spending money on military development, especially when you can send it on, um, you know, boosting your economy or uh, creating more social services for the people living in your nation. And so the Republic would just allow the Outer Rim, usually, to just soak up damage from whatever invading army was attacking them. And then slowly the, uh, the industrial output of the Republic would be retooled to produce military weapons. And by the time they had things going, whatever faction that was attacking them didn't really stand a chance against the might of the Republic economy. That's why most old Republic military forces, whether when fighting against the Mandalorians or the Sith, only struggled in the opening months and years of the war. But once they got that industrial military complex running, they were able to reverse the enemy's gains very quickly and then destroy them. If you take a look at most of the major conflicts in galactic history, despite the huge size of the galaxy, wars never lasted more than a few years, indicating a complete imbalance of power. The Clone Wars lasted less than three years. The main part of the Mandalorian Wars, which started after the Battle of Anquo, only lasted about four years as well. The Jedi Civil War lasted from 3959 and ended at Rakata Prime, also within three years. The Great Galactic War would last 28 years long, but that was the result of the Hidden Sith Empire preparing for war for more than 1300 years. So there you have it guys, you know, not to sound paranoid or anything like that. I love peace, I love the lack of war in as many places as possible, but when you do have long periods of peace, your military tends to overestimate their own abilities, and this is why it's important to stay vigilant and uh, put a lot of investment in understanding military history and also educating you know, the future generations in how to make sure innovation and adaptability are key tenets of your military force. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.